בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים. We're back here, ברוך השם, starting a new week, right before Shavuot, to uh, continue our series and get closer and closer to the completion of the series of the Jewish Ashkafa, by, uh, based on the uh, series of the Chazonish uh, Sefer Emunah V'Bitachon that we've been doing already for several years. Uh, as we get closer and closer to the end, there's certainly a lot more fundamental issues that uh, the Chazonish is, the, uh, is bringing up that uh, certainly are going to uh, help our perspective get to the right Ashkafa. Tonight's shiur is for the Refuash Lemay and Atzlacha Rabba for Moreno Verabeno Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, uh, Rabbanit Sarah Bat Anat, Rabbanit Levana Bat Sarah, Sarah Bat Ana, uh, uh, Levana, Ovadia Ben Levana, Yosef Ben Levana, Avi Mori David Ben Nesriya, Imi Morati Doris Bat Jora, Naomi Bat Sarah, uh, Sarah Bat Sarah, and all of Am Yisrael and all the righteous Noahais that continue to support the organization and do everything they can to help us spread the Torah around the world and also do as much chesed as possible with the tzaddikim in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, anyone that wants to uh, donate to help us feed the poor tzaddikim in Eretz Yisrael, uh, we're focusing uh, this year, uh, uh, this holiday, on uh, several hundred uh, families in uh, Tveria, families of Avrechim, so this helps both the world of Torah and also Chesed. Uh, and uh, we have, Baruch Hashem, a, a huge campaign and a food distribution that's been uh, going on all day today and Bezat Hashem tomorrow. So anyone that wants to donate, you could just simply click the uh, link uh, that's going to be uh, in the description box or in the comments, uh, or you could simply donate on our... Um, regular website, bezratashem.org or bhtorah.org. For anyone that has uh, issues uh, donating on bezratashem.org or on the campaign, you can go to bhtorah.org or on the app. It has Each one of them has different uh, payment terminals that uh, you can use. Uh, also, as a reminder for, for some of you uh, to order some books and USBs to distribute uh, in your community, Bo Hashem. Uh, we're getting a lot of amazing feedback for uh, for this book that's in English and Hebrew. It's helping a lot of people get some chizuk, uh, especially people that uh, are uh, newly married, the people that are uh, young, that want to get some uh, good foundation for their family as they start out. This book by Rabbi Ephraim and the Rabbanit uh, as, uh, certainly uh, gives a really quick and to the point Dvar uh, Torah about a lot of different issues. Uh, also, as a reminder for anyone that hasn't done it already, uh, there is a special prayer that parents are uh, should do uh, during this time, uh, you know, before Shavuot. Ideally, it was, uh, should have been done on Rosh Chodesh uh, last week, but if you haven't done it, you could pretty much do it all year round, but this is an auspicious time to uh, do a special prayer uh, for your children. Uh, it's the Tefillah of the Shla Kadosh. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that some of you have seen some posters like this or uh, from other places like Art Scroll. Uh, this is really uh, a well-known uh, sgula or a prayer that people do each year uh, during this time for their children. Uh, you can get this uh, online uh, from Art Scroll or from uh, many other places, uh, the prayer for the kids of the Shla. Uh, so with that being said, we have, uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, a lot uh, to, uh, to learn, a lot to address and uh, really uh, go back to the uh, the basic fundamentals of Judaism uh, is is really uh, has never been more important than it is right now, as you see a lot of confusion in the world. Unfortunately, uh, the uh, you know the, the world that we see as we is really coming closer and closer to what the Or Chaim Kadosh uh, said a couple of hundred years ago that before uh, the Mashiach arrives. Uh, Am Yisrael will reach the 50th level of Tum'ah. Uh, and uh, which type of Tum'ah? The Tum'ah of heresy. So there's going to be a lot of heresy, a lot of things that are antithetical to the Torah, that are going to be preached, that are going to be in your inbox, that are going to be text to you, that are going to be shown online. And as we discussed in the last couple of weeks, where every other day it seems like there's a new so-called Jewish podcast that comes out, uh, with more heresy, more uh, uh, blasphemy uh, that's against the Torah, uh, and it's uh, confusing a lot of people. Uh, and it's uh, even the uh, people within the Torah community uh, have been confused 
uh, throughout history, and uh, this generation is uh, not any different. Uh, in fact, this is one of the main things we're going to discuss tonight to really try to get an uh, understanding of one of the fundamentals uh, of the Torah that starts at Bereshit, Adam Arishon. Uh, you know, it seems like many people discuss the, uh, the original sin, uh, Adam Arishon, eating from the tree of knowledge. Of course, from the uh, idol-worshipping world, they think that it was a tree of apple tree, which, of course, it was not an apple tree. Uh, the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin discusses the four different options uh, that it could have been. It could have been figs, it could have been wheat, it could have been uh, grapes, it could have been a etrog. Uh, four different options. And uh, one of the uh, Chachamim from uh, Kisei Rachamim, the Alav uh, Shalom. Uh, uh, he uh, uh, actually gave it a, uh, an easy way to, uh, to remember it. As far as the hint of the uh, Etz Adat, the uh, tree of knowledge is called in Hebrew Etz Adat. And uh, Arav, uh, uh, Nanchuri, Arav Nanchuri, Arav Nanchuri, Shalom, said that the, uh, the word Adat, which means the knowledge, the tree of knowledge, uh, is uh, four letters, Hey Dalit. Ein Taf, He stands for Hadar, which is the Etrog. Dalit stands for Dagan, which is the wheat. Um, Ein for Anavim, for grapes. And uh, Taf for Teenim, for uh, figs. Uh, so this is an easy way to understand the four choices. As the Gemara in Masechet Sanhedrin, page 70b, uh, says these are the four choices. And it's certainly not an apple tree. But the point being is, is that while the tree... Uh, could be four different options. There's a even more important uh, lesson to be learned from there, which is why don't we know which tree it was? Just like why did Adam Arishon eat from it? I mean, he was a genius. He was beautiful. He was uh, the only one that was created from Hashem's hands directly. I mean, why did he sin? These are simple questions. And of course, every Joe Schmo with a hat and a beard will uh that uh you know will tell you a story oh you know it uh you know he didn't mean to he did mean to god wanted him to and of course the famous rasha merusha heretic that uh Baruch hashem our uh, bet din has uh signed a letter uh against him uh and uh is now uh going to be publicizing it and bezat hashem uh going to help many more people in the Froom community, know how dangerous he is. Manus Friedman uh, has said more than once that, uh, you know, he thinks that uh, God wanted Adam and Chava to sin. In so many words, he told them not to do something because he wanted them to do it. Now, if this is not an Isu Torah that you are a violation of a Torah that you're accusing the creator of, I don't know what is. A Kadosh Baruch Hu tells Adam Arishon not to eat from the tree of knowledge, but Manus, the menace, Friedman, or what Rav Mizrahi Shekhe calls him, Santa Claus, says to people and gets two and a half million people to actually listen to this garbage, he says, no, no, God wanted him to sin. And of course, he will say that this is Hasidut. This has nothing to do with Hasidut. You will never find this in any Sefer Hasidi. Why? Because it's accusing God of being a criminal. This is no different. In any way, shape, or form, the, the new religion created by Manus Friedman is no different than the new religion created by the Christians where a heretic named Yoshke, Jesus of Nazareth, was deified and turned into some god. How do they say? They say that, it's hard to even say this, but I have to say it so you guys understand the stupidity here, that Hashem stole the wife from Joseph the carpenter, who, by the way, the Gemara says was practically was a goy. But anyway, they're saying that God, in so many words, he stole the wife of Joseph the carpenter and 
there came the baby, Jesus. So, a new religion was created by adultery. They are worshipping a deity, which they obviously think is God, but they're worshipping a deity that committed adultery. Now, this obviously sounds stupid to anybody that actually thinks about it. It is no more stupid than to say that God wanted the Damarishon to sin. So why did Adam Rishon sin? You should ask that question. And that is what we're going to address. That is what we're going to address, Rabotai Karim, starting right out of the gate with some fireworks you get. Hold on to your chairs and understand that the fundamentals of Judaism are is not a toy that you could just manipulate like putty, that you could play Play-Doh with it. If you violate the fundamentals of Judaism, you violate the foundation that everything stands on. And the Chazonish that has been teaching us for the last several years the fundamentals of Jewish Ashkafa, in the last chapter of his unfinished work, Emunayin Bitachon, in the third section, the Chazonish tells us that Adam Arishon, being the first human being, was the perfect human being, meaning as perfect as a human being can be. And he was at a point where he was able to hear God's voice, which we will explain momentarily. Obviously, this is, as the Chazonish already explained, for each prophet, God created a sound for him to hear, a voice for him to hear, as God does not have physical features like men do. And even Cain, his son, who murdered his other son, Hevel, despite murdering his brother, was still able to hear God's voice. Now, of course, there are people every other day that send messages claiming that they hear voices in their head. They think that God's speaking to them. Or like some crazy guy in Israel who made Aliyah several years ago thinks that he's Mashiach just because he knows how to count numbers and do the gematria of several things. There are many crazy people out there that think that they are prophets and that God is talking to them. But here we're talking about God himself saying, I spoke to Adam. I spoke to Cain. In fact, I even have those conversations documented in both the written and the oral Torah. And thereby with Noah and Avram Avinu. Different conversations that the Creator, Ishtabach Shimo La'ad, May his name be all blessed. Documented in order for us to learn. In order for us to learn fundamental lessons for our lives today. Nearly 6,000 years after Adam Rishon. Nearly 4,500 years after Noach. about 4,000 years after Avram and 3,300 years after Moshe Rabbeinu. We see, Rabotai, that these conversations and the select few words that HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose to put in our Torah have a whole lot more meaning than the simplification that people want to do with the creation, with the creator, and just say, oh, they're just like you. You make mistakes. They made mistakes. You eat something you're not supposed to eat. 
Adam Arishon ate something that's not supposed to eat. Did you ever have a time where your, ma- your, your mom or your wife made a nice dish for the guests that are coming and she told you don't eat it and you ate from it anyway and she got really upset? That happened to you? Okay, so that was Adam Arishon. This moronic oversimplification of the creation of the primary of creation, Adam Rishon, and of the words that HaKadosh Baruch Hu chose to put into the Torah, is an insult to anyone that spends even a year dedicating their life to the Torah, needless to say someone that spends their life learning Torah. So Rabotai Karim. We have to obviously address these issues by first identifying the fact that there is a mistake in what many have been hearing in our current generation, in what many have been listening to in our times. And there's no better place to find what the truth is than the sources themselves, than the Torah itself our holy sages, to try to get an understanding of what transpired here. How does it affect me and you today? You and I today. How? Why do I need to know that Adam Rishon ate from the tree of knowledge? What difference does it make to me? Why do I need to know that God destroyed the generation of Noah. What difference is it to me? They're gone. Why should I cry over them? Why should I care? What I, why should I read it every year? As a Jew is obligated to follow the Shulchan Aruch that says that every Jew has to read the weekly parasha three times, every, three times, twice. You read the parasha and once with commentary. So you're telling me that I have to read the story of Adam Arishon and creation no less than three times a year. The story of Noah no less than three times a year for the rest of my life. Perhaps it's time I knew what happened. Now, Rabutai, one of the things that many people that watch our shirim get inspired to do is to help not only themselves do tshuva stop with all of the sins that they know about whether it's desecration of shabbat or immorality or stealing in their business or whatever other things that they're doing wrong in their life but they get inspired to help other people other people in their life other people in their family to also abandon their wicked ways because they realize that obviously it's not only to their best interest to stop going against God, but also there's a consequence if they don't. So it's important for a person to know that if there is miseducation out there that your friends, that your family have heard, this lesson is no less important than all of the other lessons before. Because if a person oversimplifies the Torah, the Torah becomes a man-made document that's full of mistakes, that's humanized, and that could easily be rejected. So the first thing that we need to understand is that the Torah is from God. And therefore, any misunderstanding that we have or anything that we simply don't agree with is our own lacking and not the Creator's. The moment you try to humanize the Creator, minimize His instructions to your own oversimplified human logic, that's the moment that you change the Torah. This is what happened with Christianity. 
This is what's happening with menace. This is what's happened with all forms of heresy that's out there in the world. So a person needs to know that the moment that you start minimizing the Torah and start removing fundamental parts of it, you're going to eventually create something that's not the Torah, that's not Judaism. And little by little, it'll become more and more foreign to what the original is. Sort of like what happened with the Moranos, the people that escaped the death penalty of the Christian church in Spain by simply pretending to accept the cross, accepting the Christianity, but behind closed doors, they still practice their Judaism. Of course, these Jews did, could have easily left Spain like hundreds of thousands of other Jews did, but we're not here to judge anybody. We're simply here to state the facts that they could have left. Yes, that would have meant hardship. Yes, that would have meant they would have lost all of their money. Yes, that would have meant a disaster, but no more of a disaster than a disaster that ended up happening by the choice that they made, which is to hide their Judaism behind the scenes. Now, when you hide your Judaism, what ended up happening with many of them is that they ended up getting caught, practicing Pesach, practicing Shabbat, practicing different things, and then they got tortured much worse than anybody else. And for those that heard about their fellow Jews pretending to be Christians in Spain before it became the nothing that it is today, they became scared to practice Judaism. So they hid it even more. But before you knew it, just a generation later, people had to literally grow up thinking that they were Christians and they were only told that they were Jews once they were teenagers, 17, 18, 19 years old. But what did they do for the first 18, 19 years? They ate pig, they violated Shabbat, they simply kept nothing. Now why do I mention this? The original plan of the Moranos was to hide their Judaism in order to protect their Judaism. To hide their Judaism in order to preserve it. In reality, it was also to preserve their money, their positions, all the types of things that HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted to take away. They stuck to the material. And they hid the spiritual. In the end, they lost both. Because after just a generation into marriage, increased to the point where virtually none of them remained Jewish. And anyone that ever wanted to return to Judaism generations later and until today had to convert to Judaism just like any other non-Jew that wants to become a Jew. In fact, today we live in a world where people have hid their Judaism to such an extent that you have a generation of Moranos, even people that didn't come from Spain, people that live in America are hiding their Judaism, people that live in England are hiding their Judaism, people that are living in Israel are hiding their Judaism to such an extent that you see people are not keeping Shabbat, they're not keeping holidays, they're not keeping Nidan, they're not keeping anything. And this all started with someone at some point daring to remove parts of the Torah's obligation. Whether it's the obligation of modesty or the obligation of observing Shabbat or the obligation of being proud as a Jew and being willing to die for it. We have become a generation of Moranos that are hiding our Judaism until the Goy comes and reminds us of it. With all of the protests in the universities and streets around the world, 
They're reminding us how much they hate us. Rabotai, Adam Arishon was nothing like us. To think that he was is an oversimplification of the foundation of the Torah. And it's of utmost importance for you to know just a little bit of how different. Adam Arishon, as the Chazonish says, was literally the perfect human being. Perfect in a sense where Akadosh Baruch says, "Betzelem Elokim Baraoto." Akadosh Baruch created him in his image, not a physical image, as we discussed in a previous lecture. I think about two weeks ago. This tzelem is actually a tool, like a some type of tool that a spiritual tool that Akadosh Baruch Hu uses to combine the spirituality with the physicality. Because if you put something spiritual, purely spiritual into this world, no one will be able to perceive it. If you put something that is too material, physical, in a spiritual world, it'll simply disintegrate into nothing. It'll be worthless. So to combine the neshama, the soul that HaKadosh Baruch Hu instilled in Adam HaRishon into physical matter required some type of vessel. And that's the tzelem. Now, to give us a little bit of an understanding of the significance of Adam HaRishon and how different he was from us, we need to go no further than the Gemara. In Masechet Bava Batra. In the Gemara in Masechet Bava Batra, page 58, tells us about one of the sages, Rabbi Bana. Rabbi Bana was not only one of the Torah giants of the generation, but one of his works, one of his things that he did for work was that he would mark the boundaries of the uh, the burial crypts in order to make sure that people did not walk over a dead body and become impure. And the Gemara says that when Rabbi Bana would go to each one, he would take precise measurements. In fact, one part of the Gemara here talks about a strategic way of how to measure things, genius way of measuring things in a, uh, in a very, very precise way. And Rabbi Bana wanted to take measurements of the gravesite of the forefathers, Avraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, in the Me'arat HaMachpelah, which is also a place that Adam Rishon and Chava are buried. When Rabbi Bana reached the Me'arat HaMachpelah, the cave of Me'achpelah, the Gemara says, his holy eye saw Eliezer, Eliezer Eved Avraham, Eliezer, the servant of Avraham, which the Chachamim teach us in Masechet Derech Eretz, that he's one of the seven people that never died. And the Kalara Bati says there was nine people that never died. Either way, Eliezer, the servant of Avraham, sanctified himself, even though he was a Canaanite and the son of Nimrod, the chief idolater. Eliezer Eved Avraham sanctified himself to the point where he became one of the nine people that never died. He went to Gan Eden with his clothes on. We can barely survive the day without dirtying our clothes. He went to Gan Eden with his clothes on. And Eliezer Eved Avram is standing there guard over the cave of Machpelah into a section that you're not allowed to go to today. 
or really any other day, unless you are someone that's of the highest caliber of holiness, and anyone that has tried to go there did not survive to tell the story. And there were a few exceptions of holy peoples, I've told you guys in stories in the past, one of the uh, the forefathers of the Abu Hatzira family, Rabbi Azulai, he, uh, he um, went there and um, to get the uh, sword. He was uh, of the, uh, the sultan, the Turkish sultan, that dropped the sword there. And every soldier that he sent inside to get the sword died. And then they said, you know what? Before you know, we're going to kill the entire army this way. Bring one of the Jews. And they knew that this is not a place that anybody would simply be able to survive going to, but Rav Avraham Azulai not only went down there, but he even told of what certain things that he saw that are above and beyond the scope of this shoe. But very few were able to go into this place that Rabbi Bana went to. And when he gets there, he sees Eliezer, the servant of Abraham. And he says to him, I want, I want to see the, my father, Abraham. Eliezer says, you can't just come in here. You need permission. He says, what's Abraham doing? He says, Avraham right now is lying in the arms of Sarah and she's playing with his hair. Obviously, this is an analogy that the Avraham and Sarah are still together as a husband and wife are, but it's not in the same fashion as the dirty minds would think. So Rabbi Bana says to Eliezer, go tell Avraham, my father, that uh, I want to come in. Eliezer goes and he tells Avraham, and Avraham says, let him enter. As it's well known that there's no physical desire in this world, meaning that we don't have to worry about him seeing something inappropriate, even though Sarai is next to me. We don't have to worry about anything. We are in a world that there is no physical desire, there's no immodesty, morality, none of this filth of this world exists here. Let my son here, let my son, obviously, great, 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 great son, Rabbi Bana, in, let him come in. So the Gemara says that Rabbi Bana comes in and he measures the graves to make sure all the sizes and he goes over Avram, he sees Yitzchak, he sees Yaakov, and now he wants to go and see Adam Arishon. That's also in the same department. But as soon as he gets close, the Gemara says there's a bat kol, there's a heavenly voice that comes out. It says, oh, oh. stops him. You have gazed at the likeness of my image, meaning you saw Yaakov, that he's the likeness of my image. Do not gaze at my image itself, meaning do not gaze at me, Adam. Don't come to my grave. Don't come see me. Like you saw Yaakov. Rabbi Bana says, but I want to mark the extent of the crypt above the ground, so I have to enter in order to make sure that it's precise. Adam Arishon responds to him and says, just like the dimensions are of the outer crypt of where you saw Yaakov, the same thing is for me. The same thing. Rabbi Bana says, I only got a glimpse. I peeked. I didn't go in. He didn't tell me I couldn't go in, but he didn't say I can't peek. So I peeked. What I saw were the two heels of Adam Arishon. 
meaning the lowest part of his body, which on the world of spirituality, you should know the reason why you're not allowed to touch your feet and then pray or touch your feet, then eat, touch your feet, then uh, learn Torah. But rather, if you touch your feet, you have to go wash your hands is because your feet always have tuma on them. This doesn't make you a bad person. It simply makes you human because the feet are always touching the ground. And therefore, they're always touching the source of tuma. This is also the reason why if somebody touches their feet in the middle of prayer, they have to stop and they have to go wash their hands. If they are, if they want to eat, they have to go wash their hands. Without, they don't need to do a blessing, but they have to wash their hands if they touch their feet. Even more so, a person needs to know that the to uh, in, in the previous generations, some of the chachamim were very critical over people walking around barefoot outside. Now today it's not the same because we have flooring. So people don't usually walk on sand or or, uh, the ground itself. There's usually all types of tiles on the floor, so it's not necessarily the same. But nonetheless, the person needs to know that the feet in the world of spirituality is the lowest level of spirituality is at the feet. Highest, obviously, is the mind. So when you evaluate the Kedusha of the physical body of Adam Arishon or the soul of every one of us which has the soul itself has the image of, a, of, a, of the body. Meaning if you ever got to see your own soul your soul looks like your body. Now if a person makes sins that are detrimental sins those sins make holes in the soul and can even eventually amputate that part of the soul. Meaning if he makes sins with his hands, he can start having, his soul can have holes in his hands. So his body looks normal. His body looks perfect. But the soul has holes in it. Like somebody used a machine gun on that part of the body. Worse yet, he can even lose that arm or leg or other body part. Sometimes the opposite. You see a person has no legs, either because they were born that way or they had some type of tragedy happen to them. So they don't have any legs, they don't have any arms. But when they go up to the Shemaim, they have arms, legs, everything fully healthy with no sins on it. But either way, in the world of spirituality the highest level of purity is the head lowest is the feet the biba na says i got a peak at the feet of adam arishon and his heels which is the lowest of the lowest parts because that's the one that always touches the ground The heels were like two orbs of the sun. That's how radiant his skin was. His heels were like two angels that a Kadosh who has that are the sun. That's how extraordinary they were. And the Gemara continues to compare the beauty that has simply deteriorated from or or diminished or simply evaporated or whatever other word you want to use from this world since Adam Arishon says the beauty of Sarai Menu in comparison to the most beautiful person that you have in the world today Versus Sarai Menu at a hundred years old. Where she just gave birth to our firstborn son 
and only son, Yitzchak, at 90. What is the beauty of Sarah versus the most beautiful woman in the world today? The Gemara says, that woman today looks like a monkey with hair on its face next to Sarah Imenu. That's how beautiful Sarah Imenu was. And Sarah, if you compare Sarah next to Chava, next to Eve, the wife of Adam Arishon, Sarah looks like a monkey next to Chava, next to Eve, the wife of Adam. And if you compare Eve, Chava, to her husband, Adam, Chava looks like a monkey. Chava looks like a monkey next to her husband, Adam Arishon. And this is without all of the grooming that feminine men do today. Where they spend more time at the manicure, pedicure than even their wives. In fact, the Midrash says that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu was preparing Chava for Adam Rishon, he beautified her and he even did her hair. He made sure her hair looks pretty for her husband. That's how much HaKadosh Baruch Hu cares about his creation. Now what about Yaakov Avinu who is said over here that he looks like uh, Adam Rishon. The Gemara says here one of the sages named Rav Kahana he was extraordinarily beautiful. Something unreal. Something extraordinary. Natural beauty. His beauty was similar but not as much as Rav. Rav was one of the giant sages, was also the one that wrote the Zohar for Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Rav, who was also named Rabbi Abba. Rav was extraordinarily beautiful, something out of this world. And his beauty was not as much, but similar to Rabbi Abau. Rabbi Abau had a beauty something unbelievable but it wasn't even close to Yaakov Avinu Yaakov Avinu we always know that Yosef was beautiful Yaakov was more beautiful than Yosef the beauty of Yaakov was to such an extent that HaKadosh Baruch Hu made him so beautiful he took the image of Yaakov and he put it on the throne of glory, on the Kiseh Kavod. The Kiseh Kavod of HaKadosh Baruch Hu has four images on it. Has the image of Yaakov. Has the image of the uh, lion, the bull, and the eagle. This is why you can't have statues of these four uh, beings. Now Yaakov, his beauty was the semblance of the beauty of Adam Rishon. So here, Rabotai, we're seeing that Yaakov Avinu, our forefather, who is on the Kiseh Kavod, was still not as much as the Adam Rishon. Still not as much as Adam Rishon. Very, almost identical, but it wasn't quite it. Why? Adam Rishon was created literally in, from HaKadosh Baruch Hu himself. It wasn't a creation of the creation. He was the one and only that was created this way. Even Chava, although created by Hashem as well, but she was created in a different way where he took a piece of Adam and made that into Chava. So, obviously, these are all things that are above and beyond any human logic, but just to give you guys an understanding 
of where we're working here. Now, Rabbi Abau tells us that he saw the heels of Adam Arishon and they were like sun. So now, when a person starts to think, how does somebody that's the primary of creation, that is beautiful, that is a genius, that has wisdom instilled into him, to the point where when he sees the animals, he's not looking at an animal like you look at an animal. If you go to the zoo and you see birth of the elephant... At best, you enjoy what you're seeing or you don't enjoy the smell that comes with what you're seeing. That's at best. If you watched a few Discovery Channel slash YouTube videos, you may even know the type of elephant you're looking at. Based on the ears, based on the color, all types of things. But that's at best. You're not going to know anything else. You look at a horse, you're going to be able to tell that horse is a certain color. You may even be able to tell the breed if you've spent enough time chasing horses. You may or may not enjoy the smell that comes with it, but nonetheless, the horse is the horse. And you looking at a horse, even if you are a world-renowned expert, it still remains a horse. And the same goes for every other creature that you will see using your human eyes. Adam Arishon had wisdom instilled in him by a Kadosh Baruch Hu to the point where no one had to tell him that the horse is a horse. You only know that the horse is a horse because someone taught you when you were a little kid that's a horse. They gave you one of these books that's a bestseller that they sell to babies and pretty much every parent, no matter the religion, buys it. There's a picture of animals. You have a horse and you have a cow and you have a dog and a cat and you have cars and planes and whatever you have and you show the baby, this is a horse. And the baby says horse. And this is a cow. And it does moo. And the baby says cow, moo. And that's how you know. So 20 years later when you went to the zoo and you became like a zoologist for the day, you knew you were looking at a horse because someone told you it's a horse 20 years ago. Adam Rishon didn't need anybody to tell him that the horse is a horse. In fact... HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave Adam HaRishon the task to be a partner in creation by naming the animals. He came up with the names for the animals because the wisdom that Hashem gave him allowed Adam HaRishon to look at the animal and see the essence of the animal. Not just what the animal looks like, how many legs it has, and how fast it runs, or it jumps, or it flies, and what it eats, and where it, uh, uh, whatever it does. He was able to see the essence of the animal, the purpose of the animal, what it likes, what it dislikes, why it's in this world. And he named the animal based on its essence. To say that someone that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created with that level of wisdom, with that level of beauty, with that level of spirituality where you literally have someone that is, if you had to put a percentage on it, 90% spiritual, 10% physical. To say that he made a sin just like you made a sin. As if you go to the local shawarma place and you see the shawarma roll rotating and you start salivating because you want shawarma. 
and you start thinking about in your imagination how the tchina is going to be poured inside your pita and whether the guy behind the, uh, the, the desk over there, the counter, whether he's going to put the tchina only on top of the shawarma that you're going to buy, that's certainly overpriced at this day, or he's going to be one of these really good guys where he's going to put a little bit of shawarma, then he's going to put some tchina, perhaps even a little bit of Israeli salad, then he's going to put some more shawarma, then some more tchina, then he's going to put a little bit more salad, and then he's going to top it off with, you guessed it, a little more shawarma and some more tchina. That's your imagination. That's what you look at when you go to the, to the shawarma place. To think that Adam Arishon thought like you is 100% apikosut. Heresy of the utmost level, but it first has to be established that it's stupidity. As all heresy is. To say that Adam Arishon sinned because God wants him to sin is like I said earlier, is calling a God a criminal. Violating his own Torah. Putting a stumbling block in front of his own creation. Hypocrite. Liar. All types of horrible things that you cannot even use in the same sentence as God. Where his signature is emet. So since that is well established and known by all normal people with a brain that's still working, we have to go to Adam Arishon. And now that we have established that Adam Arishon does not look at shuarma like you do, does not look at animals like you do, we have to see, wait a minute, how did he sin? Well, we have to learn more about Adam Arishon to see how different he was than us. Maran Masechet Sanhedrin says anyone that wants to be saved from the birth pangs of Mashiach, says Rabbi Eliezer ben Holkinos, should uh, toil in Torah and Gemilut Chasadim and uh, overwhelming kindness. And there is no greater kindness than helping people do tshuva. But of course, even though we worry about people's neshama, we always have to worry about their bodies as well. And that's why our organization continues to uh, share as much as we possibly can with different people in Eretz Israel that uh, need need help, especially during this holiday. So we have the campaign right now going on, the food campaign. We uh, already uh, sent a bunch of money, Baruch Hashem, today and yesterday uh, to uh, the different uh, supermarkets to uh, uh, feed about 250 families in Tveria so far. And Be'ezrat Hashem, uh, more of you are going to uh, partner with us so we are able to do even more than what uh, we're doing, Baruch Hashem. So anyone that wants to donate to help us feed the poor people in Eretz Israel. Uh, especially in the north that is under attack by Hezbollah, Imach Shimam Vizicham. If you want to help us, you could donate on the uh, Shavuot campaign, and I'm sure that the uh, links are going to be in the description and the uh, comments and everywhere else if you want to uh, donate, or you could always donate on our regular website or on our app, uh, bezlatashem.org, or the app, the the bezlatashem app, uh, and uh, certainly uh, help us with this uh, very, very uh, important cause. You see, the Chazonish tells us that Adam Arishon was able to hear God's voice. Obviously, as we've said repeatedly, 
This is a voice that was created for the sake of Adam Arishon, just like a new voice was created for Moshe Rabenu that sounded like his father, just like a voice was created for each one of the prophets. Adam Arishon had a voice that he heard God speak. Now, if you're hearing some voices, I promise you it's not God. Why? Because you're not scared. And now all of a sudden that you hear what I said, you're going to tell me, no, no, I heard it and I got scared. You're not scared. Well, we see, Rabutai, Adam Marishon was scared, but not always. In chapter 2 of Sefer Bereshit, the book of Genesis, we see that Akadosh Baruch Hu himself writes about the conversation he had with Adam Arishon, meaning that this conversation is important, is critical, is fundamental for us to know, for us to believe, for us to follow. Today, it says that Hashem, God, commanded man, saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and bad you must not eat thereof. For on the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. So we see in chapter 2, verse number 16, Hashem speaks to Adam. Is Adam scared? Doesn't look like it. Doesn't say Adam is scared. Then it says again, another conversation. In in the same chapter, the next verse, 18. Hashem says to Adam, it's not good for man to be alone. Meaning, Hashem speaks to Adam multiple times and uh, Adam is not scared. Adam is not scared. But then, after Adam Arishon falls for the trap and eats from the tree of knowledge, In chapter 3, verse number 8, we see something has changed. It says, They heard the sound of Hashem manifesting itself in the garden towards the evening. So now they hear the sound of God. He's not even talking to them. And what is this sound? So they've heard... God talked to Adam before. Why why is this? And the man and his wife hid from Hashem among the trees of the garden. Wait a minute. Before when God told you, he created you, go name the animals, don't eat from the tree of knowledge, I don't want you to be alone because it's not good for you. You were fine with all of it. Even when he threatened you that you're going to die. Now, once does it mention that you were scared. But here, God hasn't even spoken to you. He's just making a sound, if you will, to let you know he's coming. And what do you do? You hide because you're scared. And when Hashem says in the next verse, chapter 3, verse 9, Hashem called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he says, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I am naked, so I hid. Hashem responds to him, Who told you you're naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? And then obviously the dialogue continues. But you see here that something has changed. Something drastically has changed. Initially, Adam Arishon was not afraid.
But now he's petrified. Now first, we have to understand what is this voice? This voice in Psalm number 29 which David Melech teaches us about the voice of God. The whole psalm is about the voice of God. But from this psalm, the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 28b, says from here we learn the Amidah prayer. That you pray every day three times a day as a man, a Jewish man prays Amidah three times a day. Women once a day. This is the source. That it has to have 18, uh, uh, 19 total blessings. Why? Because the name of God is in here 19 times. Which says, Mizmor le David, Avu la Dunai bene Elim. Avu la Dunai, Kavod Vaoz. A psalm of David, render unto Hashem, you sons of the powerful, render unto Hashem honor and might. And we see that David the Melech mentions Hashem's name in every sentence. But interestingly enough, he teaches us also about the voice of God. He says, the voice of Hashem is upon the water. The God of glory it thunders. So Hashem's voice is on the water. The voice of Hashem comes in majesty. I'm sorry, the voice of Hashem comes in power. The voice of Hashem comes in majesty. The voice of Hashem breaks the cedars. Hashem shatters the cedars of Lebanon. So the Vida Melech tells us that the Kol Hashem, the voice of Hashem It's not like a loud voice like they make in the movies. It's not like a voice where somebody is uh, whispering or yelling. No, no. The voice of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is a unique and different in such a way that it's incomprehensible to men. where the voice of Hashem is power, it's glory. It's something that we cannot comprehend nor survive hearing. So how did Adam Rishon survive it? How did Adam Rishon survive When Adam Arishon heard God's voice initially, as we said, Adam was at a point of such purity that he was at 90% spirituality and 10% chomer, 10% materialism, physicality. But that was before the sin. After he made the sin, We know that that changed drastically because immediately after he sinned, he already became scared of just the sound of God. Needless to say, Hashem actually speaking to him. And that's why he hid. And the reason for that is because the sin that each and every one of us makes creates a deeper connection 
between the soul and materialism and physicality of this world. So when Adam Arishon made a sin, it connected them more to the physicality of this world. And therefore, any time physicality encounters spirituality, it fears the powers of spirituality. This is in your day-to-day life is applied when you first meet somebody or first introduced to someone the Torah. Immediately, you'll see a reaction that is not normal. When you introduce Torah to somebody that's very, very into materialism, you'll see that they many times will reject it vehemently, even if it doesn't make sense, even if it's not threatening their life. You'll see that they have all types of reflexes that are unusual when they're hearing words of Torah. Especially when it comes to the fundamental teachings of the Torah, such as reward and punishment. So when Adam Arishon made the sin, he stayed extremely elevated, but he was lesser than what he was. And therefore, he went from being at a level where he could speak to God without any fear to now he has a completely different perspective. He's become more material, more physical. But yet the Chazonish tells us, don't think for a moment that he became like you. Why? We can see that someone that's even less then Adam was drastically higher than you could imagine. Who? Cain. Cain murdered his brother. It was the first murder. But yet, when God spoke to him, he was still alive. Instead of God killing him, torturing him, beating him, doing whatever it is that the human mind would rationalize, Hashem simply says, where's your brother? And Cain says, what am I, his uh, keeper? I'm here as protector. In so many words, Cain is speaking to Hashem, so even though he also made a bigger sin than Adam Arishon, I mean, when you look at what happened here, it looks like it was a bigger sin. Technically, the ramifications of the first led to the second. But nonetheless, if you look at the basic things on the surface, as if we could understand them, it looks like it was a bigger sin. One ate from a tree of knowledge, the other one killed somebody. It looks like it was a bigger sin. But yet, he was still able to have a conversation with God. Now, we've all heard of the degradation of the generations. And we know that Adam Rishon went down drastically after he made the sin. Cain also went down drastically after he made the sin. The Gemara says that Cain had to have a sign with him at all times. That he had to have a certain level of protection because he was afraid that the animals will eat him because he's a murderer now. So they may view him like an animal himself. Hashem offered him protection and gave him protection for seven generations, but eventually he was killed like an animal. He was hunted by his own grandson. But either way, we still see that Cain was able to hear the voice of God and not die. Now, if you fast forward, if you fast forward, to Matan Torah. If you fast forward to Matan Torah, where we receive the Torah, you see things have changed. The Gemara says that Am Yisrael 
when we got to Mount Sinai, we were at the highest level as a nation that we ever got to. When we were in Egypt, we were at the lowest level, 49th level of Tum'ah. But each day after we left Egypt, each day Hashem gave us a way to lift ourselves spiritually, one more level, one more level, one more level, to the point where we got to the 49th level of Kedusha. Now, all of Am Yisrael at this time were prophets. All of Am Yisrael saw Hashem open up the seven heavens and show us that He's the only one that's there. Whatever that means. Because He doesn't have a body or the likeness of a body. But the Torah explicitly says that Hashem opens up the heavens to see Enod Milvado. There's nothing else but Him. And Hashem specifically says that He made sure that Ami said hears and sees His voice at Mount Sinai when He spoke the first two commandments. Why only two commandments? The Gemara in Masechet Shabbat, page 88b, says in the name of Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, what is the meaning of what is written that his meaning God's cheeks are like the bed of spices with every single statement that emanated from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed is he, the whole world became filled with the fragrance of spices. Meaning that when a Kadosh who spoke at Mount Sinai, there was an extraordinary fragrance that impacted the entire world. A smell unlike any other, beautiful smell beyond the comprehension of anybody that could, that li- that's alive. And since the world became filled with the fragrance from the first statement, where did the fragrance of the second statement go? The Holy One, blessed is He, took a wind from His storehouses and drove away the fragrance in turn. As it says, His lips are flowers, they drip flowering myrrh. Don't read it as myrrh, as uh, shoshanim, as flowers, rather as sheshonim. They repeat. So here it's talking about the two statements, the two commandments that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said at Mount Sinai. But why do you need this beautiful fragrance? Says Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, each time HaKadosh Baruch Hu spoke at Mount Sinai, the souls of the Jewish people departed from their bodies. As it says, Nafshi my soul departed as he spoke. And since their souls departed after the first statement, how could they receive the second statement? Hashem brought down a dew with which he will resurrect the dead in the future. And he resurrected Am Yisrael. And furthermore, says Rabbi Yashu ben Levi, with every statement that emanated from the mouth of the Holy One, blessed is he, the people retreated 12 miles, 12 miles. And the ministering angels helped them get back to where they were. And then he said another statement, and they went again 12 mil. So let me explain all of this and what just happened here. At Mount Sinai, it wasn't like the movies where there's a bunch of people standing at the bottom of the mountain. There's a guy on top and he's screaming 
and they're not even sure if they can understand. And then there's some lightning and some thunder. And then you have some voice that everybody hears and that's it. Yay! It wasn't like that. What happened at Mount Sinai is not something that the human mind can comprehend to the point of visualizing it, to the point of actually drawing it, to the point of actually even reliving it, even in their imagination. But we'll try to give you some type of an illustration of what the Gemara just told us. Am Yisrael is at Mount Sinai. You have millions and millions of people. Firstly, just, just that alone is not something that the human mind can comprehend. The thought process of a human being cannot get to understand millions of people being in one place. The most that the human mind can comprehend is something that it has seen before. So you have seen a sports stadium full of 50, 100,000 people. That's the most you can comprehend. You saw, let's say, some uh, protest or march that has 50, 100,000 people. That's what you could comprehend. You saw some type of an illustration, some, you know, uh, a, a visual from the air of some type of event where there is, let's just say, 500,000 people. That's what you could somewhat comprehend. To comprehend millions of people all in one place, standing, Seeing the words of God, hearing the words of God is not something that the mind has the ability to comprehend in a natural way. You would literally need something supernatural in order to be able to comprehend such a thing. Further, here we are at Mount Sinai. Millions of us And then we have Hashem's voice that is too much for our bodies to handle. The body, even though they were all prophets, even though they were all holy, even though they were all the chosen among the chosen, was still not high enough to be able to tolerate the spiritual elevation that hearing the voice of God requires. While Adam Arishon was able to speak to God initially without even being afraid, and after he made the sin, he spoke to him, but he was petrified. And Cain, his son, that made a sin and killed his brother was still able to speak to God, hear His voice, without dying. Am Yisrael, at Mount Sinai, at the highest level of Kedusha that we ever got to, in this world, was not able to reach the levels of Adam and Cain, and hear God's voice, and yet stay alive. Each time we heard God's voice, the soul of each person simply could not tolerate its connection to the body, to the physicality of this world, and it just simply left. It was as if there was some type of malfunction in the tzelim, in that connecting vessel that connects the body and the soul where that selim just malfunctioned. It just simply could not tolerate this connection between physicality and spirituality any longer. And it just stopped working. And the soul literally left. And therefore, HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought a do, something that both the body and the soul can, in essence, use to reunite once again. But if that was not enough, 
this wasn't just a bunch of millions of people just standing there and they just all died. No, the voice of HaKadosh Baruch Hu was to such an extent that everyone, millions of people, heard the voice of God and literally flew back in the air 12 miles. This is like someone put each person in a cannon more, more, uh, 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 with more strength than what they have at Navy ships. And each person was shot into the air 12 miles. The soul is in one place, the body is in another place. And Akadosh Bahu sends the angels to help them come back. Now, all of this obviously is happening in an environment that we cannot comprehend, in the conditions that we cannot comprehend. And therefore, when Am Yisrael endures this the first time, they are more than petrified. Then Hashem speaks again, and it happens again. Everyone dies. Everyone flies into the air 12 miles. Everyone gets resurrected. And everyone agrees, we cannot do this anymore. Moshe Rabbeinu, you go speak to him. We will do whatever he says, and then we'll hear. Because if he speaks again, we'll die. That's what the verse says. See, here, Rabotai, we have Am Yisrael, highest level of spirituality we ever got to. Yet, to a certain extent, cannot be compared to Adam Arishon and the initial creation. This is something that we will all return to in the future after Mashiach arrives. But the point being is, Rabotai, that when a person wants to get closer and closer to Hashem, fulfilling his holy Torah, he or she must understand that you're not going to understand. You're not going to understand everything that HaKadosh Baruch Hu said. You're not going to understand everything that you read, you're not going to understand everything that you hear, but nonetheless, you still have to do it. Why? Because if a person sees what the Chazonish is telling us here, sees the message within the message, he'll understand the point of knowing about Adam Rishon altogether. If we're not going to be Adam Rishon anytime soon, we're not even going to be Cain. We're not going to be Ami Sayyid at Mount Sinai. What's the point of all these stories? The Gemara tells us that Am Yisrael was not able to tolerate hearing God's voice and therefore they died. It was simply too much spirituality for that body. As Rabbi Ephraim explains it in a simple way where if you compare it to light, if there is no light, then you can't see anything. All you have is darkness. But if you turn on the light really, really high, then what happens? Again, you can't see. If somebody looks at the sun, they can't see. 
Yes, but it's a lot of light. Why can't you see? I thought you can't see with darkness. Yes, I can't see with darkness, but also I can't see with too much light. Why? Because my body is not equipped to handle that level of light. Same concept goes with different parts of the Torah. The story of Adam Rishon is too much light for the average person or even scholar to understand, especially those that try to explain it in a simple, superficial way. And what ends up happening many times is that people try to dumb down the Torah, try to make something that is extraordinarily higher light than they can even comprehend themselves in a way that humanizes it, that minimizes it, that changes it to something else altogether. And they try to make you relate to it by telling you, listen, he sinned just like you sinned. He is just like you. And obviously, God wants him to sin. God needs him to sin. And before you know it, they'll literally start a whole new religion around this nonsense that they created out of nothing. The point of everything that I told you is to first and foremost explain to you that we all know and agree that we are nothing like God. If you think that you are remotely close to God, you should institute yourself and put yourself into some type of bubble so you don't hurt everyone because you're a dangerous person. Everyone knows that they're not God. Everyone knows that we have no semblance to God. God doesn't need us. God is perfect. That does not really require much explanation. Those that think otherwise, like I said, they're a danger to themselves and society. But very common for people to believe that they are not different than Adam Elishon. He was a man, I am a man. He has two arms, I have two arms. He has two legs, I have two legs. He sinned, I sinned. See, no big deal. The point of the entire exercise until now is to remind us that even though he was a man and you're a man, he had arms and you have arms, he has legs and you have legs, those common denominators do not make you the same. Because if even if Am Israel, as a nation of prophets, were not even able to tolerate the voice of God, yet Adam Rishon at one point was able to speak to God without being afraid. And after his sin, he was downgraded to speaking, but with fear. We already see how far the degradation of the generations was between Adam and Mount Sinai. In fact, Rabotai, the Chazonish, after that brings up Noah and Avram. And he brings the Mishnah in Masechet Avot, chapter 5, Mishnah number 3, where it says, Asarat Dorot Minoach Vadad Avraham, that there were 10 generations from Noach until Avraham. We have Noach, was 10 generations after Adam Arishon, about 1600 years. But after those 1,600 years, we have Noah as the best of the best, surrounded by the worst of the worst. And from Noah to Avram, you have Shem, Arparshad, Shlach, Ever, Peleg, Reu, Serug, Nachor, Terach, and then Avram. You have these 10 generations. But until Noah, from, from Adam until Noah, you have Enosh, 
כנען מעלעל ירד חנוך מתושלח למך אנדה נוח. Why do we need to know these people, these names, the number of generations? A few things. The Mishnah says here, Ten generations. Ten generations between Adam HaRishon and Noach. Ten generations of between Noach and Avram. Because if Hashem would judge the world like human beings judge their family, friends, employees, neighbors, there wouldn't have been ten generations. Why? Because... If somebody does bad to you, in the best case scenario, you ignore them. In the most common scenario, you hurt them back. That's why you have war in the world. That's why people steal. That's why people sue each other. People fight. People insult. People hurt each other nonstop. But here you see the Creator showing us how different He is than even our wildest imagination. The ten generations between Adam HaRishon and Noach were not good people. These were ten generations, the Mishnah says, that angered God increasingly, one worse than the other. Each generation from Adam HaRishon until Noach got worse and worse. Went against God even worse. But God has patience. Even though he knows they're going to sin, he lets them live. Even, knows, even though he knows they're going to curse, he gives them the air in their lungs. Even though he knows they're going to violate the law, he gives them the tools they need to do it. They could certainly use all of those tools for good. They could use all of those tools to serve him. But he allows them to use it for whatever they want, even if that means to go against him. And for ten generations, the Mishnah in Masechet Avot says, each generation gets worse and worse, where you would think, as the Machzor Vitri says, that the natural consequence would be that somebody does bad against God, God should punish them right away. But it doesn't work that way. Because God has patience in this world. In this temporary world, there is patience. There's no patience in the eternal world. Once a person dies, there's no more patience. There's just judgment. And that's why Rabbi Yisraeli Salan says that when people get up to the bed dean of heaven, they're not going to recognize God. Because all they're used to in this world is the version of God that he showed them that has a lot of patience. He waited 30 years for you to do tshuva, 50 years for you to do tshuva, 60 years for you to become modest, 70 years for you to keep Shabbat. But once a person dies, there's no more patience. There's just judgment. And he showed us this patience of how for 10 generations... He gives people the food they eat and the air they breathe, the money they have, and the health. And they're using all of what he gives them to go against him. The difference, they just get worse. But they all have access to the knowledge of the one prophet that they had among them, which was Adam Arishon, who spoke to God, to Cain, who spoke to God. But for 1,600 years, there's silence. No one else speaks to God. Everyone knows that Adam is the first. Everyone knows the truth. Even the few righteous Like Ever, Reu, Nachol. They don't speak to God. Me'alel, Yered, Chanoch, even Chanoch, that a Kadosh Baruch Hu, it says in a verse in the Torah that Hashem took Chanoch to be closer to him. 
made him into an angel. Malach Memtet came from Chanoch. But he didn't speak to him. So you have 1600 years of silence. No one can handle the voice of God. Then you have Noach. Noach is surrounded by wicked among wicked. But he doesn't use that as an excuse to be like them. He doesn't justify wickedness because he's surrounded by wickedness. He doesn't say, ah, you know, we're in a weak generation, so therefore everyone's allowed to do whatever they want. Noach doesn't say that. Noach doesn't say we are in a weak generation. Noach doesn't say you're allowed to go against God just because you're surrounded by wicked people. Noach doesn't say anything that disagrees with God. Noach merits to hear the voice of God the first time in 1600 years. And he hears that God is going to destroy the world. And Noach will be the only survivor, him and his sons and their wives, and his wife, Nama. Ten more generations of wickedness, of horror, of heresy, of idol worship, of humanizing God, of creating idol worship, of making excuses to justify sins. Ten more generations from Noah until Avram Avinu. Ten generations of silence. God's not speaking to anyone. No one hears his voice. Everyone knows that Noah heard it. Everyone knows that his sons were in the flood and survived it. You have actual people that lived at the time of the Nephilim walking among you, telling you what the world looked like before Hashem destroyed it. You have people that were in the ark as the only survivors in the world telling you, don't mess with God. You have people that have heard the voice of God, but yet people go against God. Only 360 years after the flood, they build the Tower of Babel to go to war against God. Ten generations after Noah, finally, the voice of God is heard again by Avram Avinu. But again, Avram Avinu is surrounded by wicked people, is surrounded by idol worshippers, is surrounded by heretics who say that they can get powers from all types of things. They get powers from statues, from all types of tarot cards and witchcraft. They can get to be able to do whatever they want and commit any type of immorality their filthy heart desires and justify it in some way. Idol worship is the only religion. It's not just a weak generation. It is the worst. Everyone is an idol worshiper. But God does not destroy the world because there's one Avram that deserves for God to speak to him. That God actually decides to allow him to hear his voice. That God decides to make him into a nation. Now Avram could have easily said, we're in a weak generation. We should be allowed to drive on Shabbat. We should be allowed to kill people. We should be allowed to steal. We should be allowed to commit adultery. We should be allowed to do whatever we want. We're in a weak generation. There's idols everywhere. Everyone's an idol worshiper. Perhaps God needs my mitzvah. 
But Avram doesn't say that. Avram understands his role in the world is to do even better than everyone around him. Do better than even everyone before him. Do better than even the best that were before him. Avram understands that he has to not just speak to God and do his will even after making a mistake like Adam Rishon. Not just speak to God and save his family and perhaps if anybody comes to you and wants to hear what you have to say then perhaps you could help them like Noah. Avram realizes he has to share the message spread the news that God is the only God. And there's nothing else but Him. Everything else is a lie. The idol is a lie. Humanizing God is a lie. Deifying man is a lie. Even if that man is you. Deifying even somebody that is amazing, is righteous, is still wrong. In fact, Rabbi Karim, the Gemara, in Masechet Abu Dazara, the tractate that discusses different types of laws against idol worship, and what used to be, and what still is, says that Avraham Avinu had a tractate of Abu Dazara that was more than a hundred times bigger than the tractate of Abu Dazara that we have today. Because Avraham Avinu was learning not just the clear idol worship like statues and, and images, Avraham Avinu was also learning the source behind all people's desire to idol worship that comes from ego, that comes from lust, that comes from arrogance, that comes from bad character traits. The bad character traits that a person has are different types of idols that are even within the person. Avraham Avinu didn't make an excuse for himself because he's surrounded by wicked people because it's a weak generation. Avraham Avinu didn't say that perhaps the reason why we're all here is because God wanted us to sin. He didn't try to rationalize God. He didn't try to rationalize the reality of things. He simply looked into the law and he fulfilled it. God said to do something, Avram did it. God said to do something, Noah did it. God said to Moshe Rabbeinu, do something. Moshe did it. Now even though each generation was lesser and lesser than the one before it as far as the connection between the spirituality and the physicality. The spiritual, the natural spiritual elevation of Adam Rishon was certainly higher than even the generation of Moshe Rabbeinu. Needless to say, much higher than our generation. The spiritual status that was naturally in the hands of Adam Rishon and even Cain was naturally greater than anything we could reach. But yet, the opportunity that Avraham Avinu had, and the opportunity that Noah had, and the opportunity that Moshe Rabbeinu had, and all of Am Yisrael had, and still has, until today, is the opportunity that we all have in our hands. 
which is to follow the Torah. Follow what it says. Stay away from sins and fulfill the mitzvot. Little by little, this will certainly elevate our spiritual status and also lower our physical dependency and connection to this world. It's not going to get us to Adam Rishon while we're still in this world. At least not until Mashiach comes. But we can still reach a much higher level than Cain, than all of the wicked people that ever lived. Because if we do what Hashem says to do, we're achieving our purpose. So you see, Rabotai, you don't need to rationalize God in order to justify your sins. You don't need to rationalize and distort different parts of the Torah in order to justify and minimize your crimes. All you got to do is just learn from them and don't do what wicked people have done. Learn from them and follow the acts of the righteous people. Ten generations from Adam to Noah and ten generations from, Av- from Noah to, A- to Avraham to show the degree of Hashem's patience for all of those generations angered Hashem increasingly until our forefather Avraham came and received the reward for all of them. That final point is ultimately the main part of the message that a person should use to inspire themselves day in day out no you're not going to get to be Adam Rishon no you're not going to get to even be Noah or Avram and yes you're surrounded by wicked people idol worshippers heretics and so on and so forth but what you can do is you can follow what Hashem says. You can follow what the Torah says. You can follow the written Torah, the oral Torah, follow what the sages are teaching us throughout all of the generation, including now. You can follow and fulfill what you're obligated to do, man, woman, or child. And as a result of all of it, not only will you elevate yourself to a much higher level than you can comprehend physically and spiritually just from your own actions but also if you start helping other people do tshuva get closer to Hashem you put yourself in a position where you win regardless because if you try to help somebody do tshuva Get closer to Hashem. Start keeping the mitzvot. Every time they do a mitzvah, it goes to both of your accounts. Every time they keep Shabbat, it goes to both of your accounts. Every time you convince them to give tzedakah, it goes to both of your accounts. And in fact, the Mishnah says that when you convince your friend to donate money, to help Be'ezrat Hashem, to help our organization publicize Torah, to help Am Yisrael learn more Torah, to help our kolel, the reward you get for the tzedakah that you convince somebody else to give is even higher than the reward you're going to get for the tzedakah that you give yourself. So when you help other people do tshuva, you help other people do good things, you help other people follow the Torah, your reward increases exponentially. But that's not all. You see, Avraham Avinu, it says here, Avraham Avinu was surrounded by wicked people, generations of wicked people. And in the end, he received the reward for them all. What does it mean he received the reward for all all of them? Simple. Anyone from all of those generations that did not do tshuva, including the generation of Avraham Avinu, Some people abandoned their wicked ways. 
and listened to Avram Avinu and did tshuva, became monotheistic, became righteous. Avram Avinu received endless reward for each one of the mitzvahs that they did. But what about those people that didn't listen? Those people that continued to stay in their wicked ways, continued gambling, continued cheating, continued committing adultery, continued lying, continued violating Shabbat, continued going against God, continued with all of the wicked ways of the last 20 generations? Shem says, all of what they were supposed to get, the heaven that he was supposed to get, and she was supposed to get, and they were supposed to get, I gave all of it to Avram Avinu. Why? Because he tried to help them. So you see, Rabotai, when you do tshuva, you start fixing and elevating yourself. When you try to help other people do tshuva, with your success, you elevate yourself even further. But when you actually make it a part of your life to such a point where you're constantly trying to help as many people as possible and you don't let the failures get in your way. In fact, you just continue trying helping more and more people get closer to Hashem. Hashem will even reward you for the failures to such an extent that whoever doesn't listen, whoever doesn't do tshuva, they can't go to heaven but there's still a section of heaven that was designated to them. There was still a section of Olam Abba that was designated to them. Well, guess what? Since they're not going to go there, you get it. When you serve Hashem, you can't lose. This is why Rabotai Karim, if somebody ever told you that God wants you to sin or God needs you, all types of other heretical statements, you could simply answer to them. I don't need to change the Torah in order for the Torah to become beautiful. I don't need to change the Torah in order for the Torah to become favorable for me. In fact, the more loyal I am to the Holy Torah, the better it is for me. Because this way, I always win. And that's the way Our Torah has survived for thousands of years. The same way, like we got it. Let's keep it that way. Thank you for learning with me. May Hashem bless each and every one of you that learned this, that's going to apply this, and most importantly, that's going to share this with all of the victims that you're surrounded by. Perhaps you could help them. Perhaps you can get them out of their own way and into the right path that you have chosen to be on. Bezat Hashem, we will learn again together after the Chag, after the holiday. Anyone that wants to help us do more good, publicize more lectures, feed more people, to help more People get closer to Hashem can donate on our website bezlatashem.org or bhtorah.org or if you want to help us with the current campaign to feed a few hundred families in Tveria for this holiday, you could also donate on the website or on the campaign. Either way, your help will be appreciated. May Hashem bless all of you and Bezat Hashem, you all will enjoy the holiday, the holiday of Matan Torah. And this time when you arrive at this holiday, you can say, I received The Torah now, it's the same Torah that it was when Hashem originally gave it to us. Kol Tuv, Pachav Atzlecha. מברך את הרבנים הרב ירון ראובן, הרב אפרים כחלון, ראשי ארגון בעזרת השם, שיסיים לכל הכבוד, שיעלו בחור שיעלו מעלה מעלה, יהיה להם ברכה והצלחה, הקדוש ברוך הוא ימלא בלשונות ליבם לטובה ולברכה, שבכל אשר יפנו 
ישכילו ויצליחו. יזכו לעשות כאלה וכאלה, ודיעו תורה לאדירה, אמן ואמן.